<laughs> Thank you very much. Um, it is so always so great to be in Portland. I think I have done an event at PALS for all nine of my books um, uh, from the very beginning. Uh, I've come here and, and I even had an additional trip when, when the whole city was reading my book, The Ghost Map, uh, a few years ago, which was very fun. Everybody, I made everybody read a book about cholera in the 19th century. I apologize for that. Um, and so I feel like this is a very uh, special place. And it's kind of a special day for me as an author. Uh, we just got word um, that this book is going to be number four on the Times bestseller list next week. Uh, yeah, it's cool. It just came out. I, I've never been in the top 10 before. Um, so I'm really excited. Uh, it's a great. Um, uh, it's, it's great to kind of celebrate it in, in, in this space. And the, the, the one thing that's different from all the other books that I've done before, um, and another reason why it's kind of appropriate to be here in Portland, is that I have this television series that uh, either accompanies the book or the book accompanies the television series, depending on who you're talking to. Um, they were actually kind of developed together in parallel. And it's going to be airing uh, next week, um, October 15th, on PBS and running um, for four or five weeks after that, um, six episodes. Um, and uh, same title, How We Got to Now. And I thought it would just be fun to show you. We have a little kind of three-minute clip from the show to give you a sense of what it's like, and then we can talk about the book. So hopefully this will work. Imagine observing Earth from a distance for the last 100,000 years. So how did we get to today's world? Who were the people that took us out of the dark and into the light? People who actually made the modern world. People you probably never heard of. Hobbyists and garage inventors and obsessive tinkerers. Ordinary people doing extraordinary things. I'm Steven Johnson. I write about ideas and innovation. And this is the untold story of how we got to now. <laughs> wants to photograph the people in the tenements unposed and spontaneous. Could this be the innovation Reese has been waiting for? The powder underneath really kind of propels it. You can see how it was dangerous work. Reese takes this previously invisible group of people and makes them visible on a mass scale, triggering one of the great movements of social reform in American history. It's an appalling mix of human and animal excrement that you have to wade through on your way out to dinner. But Chesborough's got an incredible idea. If you can't dig down, why not lift the city up? It's a crazy idea, but it's also kind of a beautiful one. I'm the one to be the best. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Hedy Lamarr's life outside the movies is stranger than fiction. She's got a brilliant idea. Not an awesome death ray or something like that. It's a player piano. It's the first ever means of secure radio communications. Those two things coming together are just, you know, beyond understanding. So that's the heartbeat of the, of baby, the dolphin. baby dolphin. It's here that Clarence Birdseye will have the beginning of an idea that will turn out to be one of the most transformative ones of the 20th century. I think it'll probably take us about three days, do it? It'll take you three days. <laughs> Birdseye's hunch will take decades to finally pay off. The modern world of cold does not get any weirder than this. Uh, he's hugging you now. You're getting a dolphin hug. It's the idea behind it that's important. They put a kid inside the whale's head. Right. Can you guys get me out of here? It was an epic achievement. We make our ideas, and they make us in return. So there it is.
<laughs> Can you tell how fun that was to make? I mean, I hope I hope it comes across. So we 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 um, we shot it all over the world. We went to the top of Mauna Kea to the Keck telescopes there, and we went to the indoor ski slope in Dubai. I went skiing in the uh, middle of the Arabian Desert, which is a sign of how insane we are as a society. And uh, I also went into, for the, for the episode on, on clean, which is also a chapter in the book, uh, I went into the sewers in San Francisco, um, uh, which was literally the worst thing I've ever done in my entire life. Like I, you sometimes have these experiences where you're like, I, that was a tough thing, but boy, it was an intense experience. I'm glad I did it now that it's over. Not this. I wish I could erase it from my memory, you know? Uh, and of course, I have to see these clips over and over again because you watch these things and edit, you know, forever. And so I'm, I've got like PTSD from, from watching the show. Um, but what, what we were trying to do with, with the series and, and what I try to do in this book um, is to take these facets of, of modern life that in, in many cases we no longer think of as innovations or as belonging to technology and to try and in a sense kind of reawaken some of our sense of kind of wonder and, and amazement that these things work at all. Um, so in the in the clean chapter, you know, it kind of starts with this basic idea of, of you know, a clean dr glass of drinking water, which was, was central also to, to Ghost Map as a, as a book that, you know, that we we live in a world, for the most part, here in the, in the developed world, where you go to the you know faucet and you get a glass of drinking water and you drink it and you don't ever think about dying of cholera 48 hours later, right? And that is an incredible achievement uh, that you can live in a city of a million people or 10 million people and have that kind of security. That took a whole history of of invention and ingenuity and scientific breakthroughs and great engineering projects to to make that possible. And yet, while we celebrate innovation in our society all the time, everybody wants to talk about Silicon Valley and the next Apple, ga Apple gadget and all of that, which is great, and I love those things, and, and they're worth celebrating. We don't spend enough time talking about the people who made that clean glass of drinking water part of our lives. And so I wanted with this book to kind of stop and look at these, these objects, go back and tell these, these stories, um, and also <coughs> to talk about the kind of unexpected places that these technologies uh, ultimately led us. Um, this is this is this idea of what I call the hummingbird effect, which is it's kind of elaborate metaphor from nature. I was writing the book in in California, and we have these hummingbirds in our garden, and I was constantly obsessed with them and how they worked and their crazy anatomy that enables them to hover like that. And it turns out the hummingbird evolved in this interesting way, where you have you know the flowering plants and insects develop this complicated dance of pollination. And they evolve kind of in parallel with each other over over, over millions of years, but it, it's it's a connection that doesn't really have anything to do with birds, right? And then all of a sudden, this bird kind of over evolutionary time figures out that there's a way to get in on the action of all this nectar, but it has to evolve this incredibly different kind of wing structure to be able to hover right next to a flowering plant. And so, what seems to be just a relationship between insects and plants turns out to transform the anatomy of a bird, and it turns out. Technological history, scientific history, has a similar kind of pattern where someone trying to solve a specific problem in one field ends up either setting in motion a series of changes or new approaches or new platforms that transform the, the world in all these unpredictable ways. So that's the kind of hummingbird effect that I talk about in the book. And in the history of clean drinking water, we end that episode and, and the chapter ends with a visit to the uh, Texas Instruments uh, chip plant in, in Austin, Texas. Uh, you can see me in that clip. I'm briefly dressed up like in a spacesuit. Um, and th this place is one of the cleanest um, environments on the, on the face of the earth. Um, where it's where they make all these microchips. And you have to get suited up. When you get suited up like this, you generally assume that you're being protected from something. You're going into some kind of contaminated zone. In the clean room, you are the contaminant, right? You are the dirt. Um, and they have to protect the chips from you. And so that you dress up, you, can't, you actually can't even use soap to clean up because soap is too dirty for the clean room. It'll set off little particles and things like that. And it turns out that one of the things that's essential to the, the clean room and the manufacture of these chips is what they call ultra clean water, which is water that is just pure H2O. And it, in fact, paradoxically, it's so clean that human beings can't, it's not really safe for human beings to drink it. Because uh, normal drinking water has a lot of minerals in it that our bodies depend on, and so if you drink this, it, it will be bad for you.